Origin Clear is transforming the water industry with revolutionary water treatment technology and innovative financing. With me is Executive Vice President Kim Berenger to explain uh, the company. And, and recently, the water industry achieved a status of a unicorn. There have been some companies in this industry who have been unicorns, which is a private company worth a billion dollars. So tell me about that and what does that mean? For in actuality, that unicorn was created through private venture capital. Mm. I think the street's waking up to the fact that this is a massive underserved business and technology can change day to day, but water is enduring. It's not gonna go out of style, I suspect, anytime soon. That unicorn was incubated by venture capital. There was no individual investor access. So if you and I said, look, I love this idea, I wanna be involved, we're, we're boxed out. Origin Clear, what we're doing is the exact opposite. We recognize that in a trillion dollar space, you're probably gonna have more than one unicorn. This is a unicorn creating space. We want to develop the next one, hopefully, mm. uh, but focus in exclusively on individual investors to provide kind of what I would call mainstream investors or accredited investors with the same access to the same opportunity and structure it in a way that creates generational wealth. Now, and I did read that the world's first trillionaire will be from the water industry. And I believe that the quote came from Forbes Council. Mm. So. You have to ask yourself, okay, a trillionaire can be created. That's going to be an early player for sure. I don't think you can be a late stage investor in something and create a trillion dollars of wealth. But let's focus on the fact that it's going to have the ability to create a trillion dollars plus of wealth, create maybe a million millionaires. Here's what's interesting about the company that just created a unicorn. It's exclusively in private water infrastructure. Okay. This is entirely what we do. You know, if you're Anheuser-Busch, if you're Pepsi, if you're Big Pharma, you don't need decentralized water pay per gallon. What you can do is basically construct a hundred million dollar system, hire engineers round the clock, and you're not really a polluter anyway. Big businesses aren't. It's the small businesses that don't have access to that. And you've said before, water is the people's asset. So it's obviously something we need to survive. <laughs> NLPs were an instrument that was created 40 years ago, and it kind of catered to creating generational wealth for the affluent, accredited investors. It's been magnificent at doing that. It's got tax benefits. It's got income that protects against inflation. That came along when big oil was already a century old. Water, the people's asset. If you're going directly to venture capital firms, if you're going directly to hedge funds, it's not gonna be the people's asset. It's gonna be VC's asset. It's gonna be hedge fund asset. Yeah. We're focusing entirely on creating decentralized water systems. Each one will operate like an oil well for water. And by focusing on individual investors, we believe we can deliver that wealth creation opportunity, decentralize it among millions of individuals, decentralized and democratic. Yeah, well, and it definitely is an industry that seems like it's in need of disruption. Water is a highly technical business. Manufacturers can't operate where there is no infrastructure. By doing what we do, we can create a decentralized private water infrastructure system faster than they can even put up the building. You're going to see thousands of manufacturers come back from China, land in the United States, States, we can help facilitate an American manufacturing renaissance. And that's really exciting because not only because of the capital it creates, the jobs it creates, the, the, and, and of course the wealth. Because these companies need water and they may have to wait for years for some municipality to install a... Think about it, right? Think about it. So we're we going to build a manufacturing plant as soon as they build 100 miles of pipe. It's not going to happen. We could literally build them as fast as the building. The last question, Ken, uh, just about your customers. When a 30-year veteran engineer says, holy cow, guys, you've blown me away. You just handed me the easy button. Honestly, I was amazed. I was really looking for the easy button so that we can focus on doing what we do best. We've got a number of installations, North Texas, in my own area in Moscow, PA. They're putting in systems that are just changing the way people can develop property. When people have gotten used to having a certain way of operating and they think that's their only option and you get the brilliance of a Dan Early coming along with a decentralized system saying, here you go, you're in business. And when they're impressed with that, you know you've captured the right tone. Very, very nice video put together by, well, I'm biased because the videographer is my brother, <laughs> Stephen Eckleberry. Uh, he's literally made videos for our company for 14 years, and he continues to do wonderful work. And Ken Berenger was amazingly articulate 
in that piece. I think that we have got a winning story. And what I love about it is, is that it has all of these actual installations backing the, the talk, right? Say, we got decentralized private systems. And there is, boom, there is one right there. And another one, and another one, another one. And these engineers just saying, this is amazing. You just push the easy button for me. I love it. I love it so much. Okay, well, with that, let's get it on. Here we are, July 6th. I hope you all had a really good uh, 4th of July. We're moving into the summer, and it's going to be a very, very exciting summer for, for many reasons. Briefing number 218, the world's new water network. And I have to change that because I much prefer water as the people's asset because that states a policy, whereas what's a, what's a water network, right? So, but... You know, uh, water as a people's asset really makes a statement. All right, so the usual disclaimers. And now, very interesting, we have a new wa- a Florida law that tries to address the issue of on-site water treatments. Let's take a look at this. This is from the Miami Herald from June 26th. And a bunch of laws were passed in the Florida session. There was a, a lot of really breakthrough legislation done. Florida is probably the most aggressive uh, legislative um, state right now. So what happened? Well, one of these things um, is uh, House Bill 1379, and it gets into uh, water quality. Now, let me just dive into this uh, bill a little bit. So we have here, uh, there's some terms they use. All right, first of all, on-site sewage treatment and disposal systems, OSTDSs. Now that can be as dumb as a septic tank, or it can be a full-on, you know, black water recycling system like what we have put in place. Then there's these basin management action plans, BMAPs. Now, a basin is basically like the the term you know implies, is that you've got a lot of runoff going into the bottom of the basin. And so anything that happens all around that basin is critically important. So, you know, it it uh, brings to mind all the uh, septic tanks in uh, Miami-Dade County, over 100,000 of them, and that's out of control. So I think that's part of what their focus is here. And I'm glad they're doing something about the Indian River Lagoon, but let's continue here. This bill prohibits new on-site sewage treatment and disposal system, OSTDSs, within a BMAP, within a basin management plan, um, where sewer is available. Now, that is the big point here. They want to try and get sewage connected for example, sanitary sewer services here requires local governments to consider the feasibility of providing sanitary sewer services and construction of sanitary sewers to serve these areas. Well, here's the issue is that um, it's too big a job. It's just too much going on with this water quality. And so it has to go to plan B as it has in North Texas, as it has in South Texas, you know, with the manufacturers coming back and so forth. So, um, it's really interesting to watch this because this is kind of a last gasp of well, like, let's try and do something about this. But the problem is it's very slow and the funding is still an issue. So we're gonna be watching this. Now, what's our role in this? Exactly zero. We do not play with the state of Florida. We don't work at any level of lobbying. It's completely um, in, in the hands of the billion dollar water companies. Let them Let them pay the lobbyists. We're really there to deal with the growing number of self-reliant treatment systems that are that are just popping up everywhere because these plans are not working out. So fascinating developments. And uh, you know, I I think we see really um, good faith efforts to make things better with our water quality. But at the end of the day, it's going to require private water treatment as Ken so eloquently discussed in that piece a little while ago. Keith Rutten, love that easy button. Yeah, baby, for sure. All right, so let's take a look at a quick episode here. We broke this one in two because it's audio, so that, you know, it's um, not as fun to watch the people talking, of course, but still, I think it's interesting. Let's take a look. Well, welcome to another episode of Frame of Reference, Profiles in Leadership. My guest today is Riggs Eckleberry, and he is a nationally renowned entrepreneur uh, dedicated to revolutionizing the water industry, which has reached a critical breaking point in recent years, despite being essential to the planet's survival. So I think we could say, if you don't know about Riggs Eckleberry, you're 
not all wet. Uh, cause you should oh. know, isn't that, huh? Huh? Do you like, the, I've been thinking about that one for a while, Rick. So he is also qualified to bring change to an outdated and overrun industry, which I want to find out more about that. Uh, and we like to start out always with a thing called my favorite things. Let's start with something easy. All right. How about a favorite color? It's blue. Not only do I have, I, I'm stuck with wearing blue because of at least my eyes used to be blue. I don't know if they are anymore. Um, <laughs> but also, I just love the ocean, and um, you know, spent many years as a both an amateur and professional sailor. To me, the water, big skier, sailor. I, I love water, so I would say blue. Okay, well, that's consistent, if nothing else, right? So, how about a favorite book? Well, I have to say the one that I that I that I try to you know live by is uh, called Inside the Tornado. And um, that is a book that was a successor to an equally famous um, book called um, Crossing the Chasm. Now, the whole idea of Inside the Tornado by Jeffrey Moore, a just an amazing, amazing uh, book, is that it, it characterizes uh, the high-tech product life cycle, which starts at the very beginning with the crazies, the people who actually use the Newton PDA, those people. <laughs> and then, and then it moves to the strategic buyer, the buyer that is trying to get a, an edge on the competition. And then it does this, um, it crosses this chasm, which is the big challenge to enter what's called the tornado, which is every adopts it, right? And then blow, and then it moves to a, a conservative stage. And then the back end is the, is the skeptics who are always on, always their last. I, I came up through high tech, uh, you know, starting in the 80s, and I, and I love it. I believe that everything is behaving like a high-tech life cycle these days. So um, things are moving faster and faster all the time. And I came to the water industry as a high-tech guy. Okay. What, what I'm really getting at is uh, high-tech techniques really are, are very, very good for disruption, right? Mm. What I found when I entered the water industry was an industry that was not prepared for change. They Like, everything's fine. We're going to, you know... It's a similar attitude to the one you most people have with the water coming out of their faucet or flushing out of the toilet, which is everything's fine. But it wasn't. And so um, there was it's an industry that's very hard to change. And in many ways, rightfully so, because they have a public health mission and so forth. Sure. But I had to go and find what would, you know, what was the, the point of leverage to make the fulcrum, to make this, this change happen. And um, that's where my knowledge of disruptive marketing uh, gained through 10 years of at one point I went from being an entrepreneur to being in the corporate space and for 10 years I basically worked my way up to being what I consider you know a good C-level executive and it was all about how can I break the existing situation whether it's we're struggling with with old outdated bad code or are we um do we have a great product but nobody knows about it or any variety of things. So I think that effective disruption is a good thing. And I, it strikes me too that in uh, Wisconsin, where I live, we've had a, a number of tornadoes. <laughs> so, and uh, even throughout the the rest of the United States, you find that that tornado comes through. It's very disruptive, and yet the towns that choose to rebuild, um, they often times come back stronger. Um, they come back having learned some important lessons about not only how to build things better, but uh, find out which things really, really matter in life. Um, That's very true. How about a favorite quote? I had this uh, as a young man in my wallet for years, which is the author of The Little Prince uh, wrote this. Il n'est qu'un luxe véritable et c'est celui des relations humaines. There's but one true wealth and it is human relations, right? And um, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry wrote that in a book called Terre des Hommes, Land of Men. That's the point. Essentially, every, every, you know, everything that we're doing is about that. There's a very good quote by Warren Buffett that I just love, and that is, I've never known anybody that was basically kind that died without friends. I've known plenty of people with money who died without friends, including their family. Pursuit of money is great. Pursuit of paying attention to lifestyle and what I'm wearing, and all, that's all great. But the real magic, I believe, is what we're doing right here, right? That's that's it. And everything else is kind of besides the point. Even if it is water and the source of life, it does come back to human relationships. 
How about, uh, do you have a favorite uh, food? Well, it depends on the favorite food to eat or to make. Either. You choose. You're the guest. That's the difference. I, over the years, evolved a real talent with risotto. And the reason I like risotto is it's a, it's a dish that you build over time. And you can often do it with friends around. And they're watching you build this risotto. And then they're going to eat it. Unfortunately, you know, a few months ago, I went into a keto diet. <laughs> so no more rice. And so right now, uh, I'm in love. Last night, my wife and I had a true grass fed ribeye that was done on the barbecue, and it was amazing. Really good, clean food like that. Another great dish that I love is osobuco. Okay. Kill me now. That is the best. Okay. The best. Mm -hmm. I'll have to try that. That's that's not something I have had. Although the ribeye steak thing, I am right with you on that one. So there, uh, nothing like a steak on a grill to make a day happy. How about last question? Is there a favorite place that you like to go to when you just need to kind of clear your head? A favorite thing? You, it may be a thing that you do to an activity, um, but that just is a centering thing for you. I would say that the most centering thing to do is to sit down. For my wife and I both work very hard. She's uh, she has a school to eat to sit down and have dinner together, and just just quietly talk um, about whatever. That that to me just recharges me tremendously. I had a friend that just was talking about that, kind of both reflecting on our lives and we're both in our 60s. Both of us came to the same realization that, you know, all of those dreams that you have when you're young don't really match up to the little things that happen over the course of your life that really impact us. It was interesting that he and I had come to that same realization. And, it, well, it, and, and I think that you got to find value in the small things because that's most of life, right? Yeah, yeah, very much so. And, uh, so, you know, but if you want to ask, know where physically I, I go to unwind is I'm an avid skier. Okay. And I've uh, been that way for years and years. In fact, for my 40th birthday, I went and ski bummed. I dropped my entire career, which at the time was I was working in film. And people who were come, going up the gondola while I was in my chef's uniform at Keystone, and they find out that I'd taken a break from film. They go, no, don't do it. You got to go back right away. You're looking to lose it all. But I, it was a blowout winter for me. And these days, because eventually, you know, you ski, you ski, you ski, you ski. Well, what else do you do? Well, you start to tr teach kids. And so my wife's school kids go with us to the mountains, usually once or twice a year. I love being the guy who, come on. Let me show you how to do a double black diamond, and we survive it. That's cool. <laughs> I have to say, too, Riggs, Eckleberry, it sounds like we should be talking in a British accent. So today, I have Riggs Eckleberry with me, Professor Riggs Eckleberry. I, where did that name come from? I have to know. My full name is Tenor, T-E-N-E-R, okay. Riggs Eckleberry Jr. Okay. And so my dad was known as Tenor, and I was known as Riggs. Okay. But what they are is they're a family name. So Tenor was a family name from France uh, and through via, via um, Ireland, and then Riggs. You're right. Was an English is is an English family name that was in the family. Eckleberry is German. Okay. Um, it comes from South Germany. Okay. So and and then there's a whole other side, which is my mother's side, which is from Cuba and Spain and Colombia, which is a whole other world. Okay. Um, stir it up. I'm a good mix. Wow. So you have Irish, German, and French in your name. Anywho, one of the issues I think we have, and you know, at least I personally have with uh, the topic of water, is that it, it is so neglected because we have so much of it. And yet, you know, if you go out to Arizona or, you know, California or places where they're struggling and, you know, wringing the last bits of the Colorado river out, you know, to, to get by and, you know, struggling because they can't have their lawns be as green as they would love them to be, you know, whatever the, the crisis of the day is with water, I'm kind of a, in a whole different world. Cause I grew up three blocks from Lake Michigan in Milwaukee. And, you know, we, we never thought too much about it because there was plenty of it there that, you know, we just, at that time, just scooped it up from the lake and did a little bit of water treatment and it was fine. And yet it is so critical. So why do you think that is? Why are we so reluctant to grab a hold of the preciousness of water and use it as, I, I want to say sacredly, as we ought? 
Because it is. It's a, you know, a gift that uh, farmers that I know in our community talk about, you know, never curse the rain because they, they remember times when they go through severe droughts and, you know, what impact that has not only on their livelihood, but on everything around them. Um, and yet we're like, ah, oh, rainy day. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I, where is that coming from? Have you looked at the psychology or the spirituality of that? Is that what drove you into this? Is somebody has to make a difference and make this better? Well, how I got into it was completely ass backwards. In brief, my, my, my story was that, as I said, I, I finally got into the corporate world and 10 years later, I was, I was, I felt I was qualified to become a CEO having also been in, you know, prior to that, a ship captain and a business owner, blah, blah, blah. This fund agreed with me, but they said, uh, we're not doing high tech anymore. We're doing green. And we think algae is the next big thing for biofuels. And so we launched a company originally called Origin Oil, which should mean, you know, algae. Petroleum doesn't come from dinosaurs. It comes from algae. As not, there are not enough dinosaurs out there to make all that fossil fuel. The idea of algae for biofuel was so powerful that I found myself, you know, getting tremendous media coverage and I was on TV a lot and so forth. The problem is that uh, fracking came along and depressed the price of oil so much that it just wasn't viable to run a company making biofuel at $120 a barrel when oil was at 40 or 50. So we pivoted into water as more of a like, well, what can we do with our technology, which is an extraction technology? Figured out, okay, you know, um, sewage, you know, um, that works. And so we went with that more as, as a, you know, alternate application for the tech that we had. And that's where we learned that water is, a, is it's, its own thing. Now, why? Well, the main thing, it's a, it's a problem of, I think it's a problem of generations of infrastructure. Let's take, for example, phones, right? Uh, Africa uh, never bothered to go to landlines. It just went straight to cell phones. And in a way, America, our adoption of, broadband and so forth was held up by having landlines, right? So you held up by your legacy infrastructure. Similarly, we have an energy grid that only talks one way. It just pushes it out like a fire hose. It does not, it does not uh, interrogate the end user like, um, would you like it differently or whatever? No, nothing like that. So we're finding ourselves having to create all kinds of alternative um, uh, structures like, like the ring system and so forth to try and get smarter about things. <clears throat> Similarly, in water... America built its water system so long ago, you know, much of it was built in the 1800s, late 1800s, we, can't, we kind of have it. Now, the problem is, of course, that populations grow and populations move, right? For example, right now, there's a giant boom going on in North Texas of people having moved there. And uh, between Dallas and the Oklahoma border, it's boom town. And we have a bunch of clients that are implementing our decentralized water system as a way to not have to connect to sewage because the utilities have not kept up with the boom. And here's the problem. Uh, behind me is Pinellas County, Florida, which is one of the most populated counties in Florida. Where are you going to put the, the water sewage system? Not going to happen. Used to be you could do a bunch of landfill in the water and build on that, but that's an environmental issue. So there's all kinds of reasons why central utilities don't get built. But even aside from the fact that the existing utilities are suffering from lack of maintenance and upgrades. So <laughs> long story short is it's making sense more and more to for industry to have its own water treatment. There's other important trends. For example, deglobalization is causing a lot of businesses to relocate their uh, manufacturing in places like South Texas, Northern Mexico, et cetera. And that is starting to happen so fast that, again, there's no time to build a central utility. So you have an integrated water treatment system that comes automatically with the brand new factory. And that's the new, new thing. The new, new thing is to for industry and agriculture to take care of their own water because 90% of all water demand is by industry and agriculture. That means the 10%, which is you and me, get short shrift. they basically, these industrial agriculture users are just in a way suffocating the system. And if we can pull them off the central system under their own, which they're delighted to do once they understand the benefits, including recycling and uh, predictable um, water rate increases and whatever, we then enable the infrastructure to serve the people better. I, th I get very hot under the collar about this because 
because of the heavy load by uh, the business users, the the ten percent really don't get get the water they need. Also, they get harassed a lot about shorter showers, but frankly, they're not the big difference, right? Mm-hmm. The, the big difference is on the ninety percent side. In Ireland, water is free. Well, water should be free, and it can be if industry takes care of its own water treatment. Isn't that interesting too? It's it's uh, like a lot of the renewable energy you know, arguments that, you know, we need to do more to conserve, conserve, conserve when, you know, even if everyone were conserving at hundred percent or close to hundred percent capacity or capability, um, it still makes a relatively minor dent in the whole scheme of things. Because as you say, you know, industries oftentimes are such huge contributors to the problem. It, it strikes me that the thing that always uh, gets in the way is it has to make business sense for a business to engage in something like you're talking about, you know, it, taking sure. care of their own water needs. Well, until they see a, a, you know, a net gain for that on the bottom line, or they see a regulation that's going to be so punitive that it, you know, it, it's to their advantage to get in line and do the thing that's either being regulated or, you know, is a great, you know, revenue stream. It just doesn't happen. Do you think there are ways to, to get around that? I mean, is it just a matter of educating and waiting for CEOs with a conscience <laughs> or, or is it, you know, simpler than that? I mean, I hate punitive situations, but sometimes it seems like that's the only thing that makes people or businesses wake up and, you know, smell the coffee or the water, if it were. Well, let's go back to that, the tornado uh, life cycle, which again, starts with the early, super early adopters moves into the strategic buyers. Uh, for example, those housing developments in North Texas are using standalone uh, sewage treatment as a competitive advantage, right? They are moving ahead of their competitors because they don't have to put in a sewage line to a utility that won't even accept it. So that's the stage where things are at. And then before that tornado, there's something called the chasm. Now that chasm in that book, inside the tornado, you have to figure out something that's gonna cross the chasm. And in our case, what we've learned is that many, many of these users, yeah, they have a problem with permitting uh, penalties and fines and so forth, but they're living with them because they're looking at a major capital expense to solve the problem. And so our invention is two, four, two part. Number one is Modular Water Systems, which is a company we built since 2018 that, that, had, that downsized the utility scale to these plug and play modules that can go right into businesses, number one. Number two is concept called water on demand, which is works a lot like all well partnerships in that you can bring regular investors to invest in a bundle of properties with their royalties secured by seizure rights on the assets, ultimately potentially generating general, uh, generational wealth, just like the oil industry, but it's water. Now, with that money, we then offer the customer, like, don't pay for the machine. It will remain ours. It'll be on your site, but it'll be our machine. You just pay on the meter like you're accustomed to. We also take care of the maintenance. In other words, it's, 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 um, it takes the problem completely away. That right now, the, the first part, the technology part, has been booming. So these are people, uh, businesses that uh, have managed to deal with the financial issue, but they are buying into you know, their housing development, their, 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 um, uh, these, for example, um, rest stops on the highway, uh, all, all these detached applications, RV campgrounds and so forth, mobile home parks. There's a variety of these that are very, very clearly need their own tri- water treatment. And then there are the big, big water users, which are pharma, chip manufacturing, energy, alternative and regular energy, and food and beverage. Those are the big four. They are now doing their own water treatment increasingly because, for example, a, a chip fab has to stop if there's a single hair in the water. It's over. The whole thing stops. So they increasingly are just doing, we'll just do our own water. And in fact, um, there's a recent unicorn that was created in our water industry that came out of MIT and was funded by some very high-end VCs that targets those four major users as being the the low-hanging fruit. And they're not even bothering to supply financial help. They're just saying, here, you're a pharmaceutical company. You don't need financial help. So though there, there's certain types of users that are naturals that we are already in a huge, you know, we tripled our business year over year between 21 and 22. So we're, we're, we're rocking with that. 
But then we want to really take off with that, don't worry, it's just a service contract type uh, arrangement and get away from the capital expense. Okay. Well, it was interesting, but I have to say, it's not as good as when you can actually see people visually, right? Uh, I see there's a question about an algae uh, production system. And uh, we have a partner who's our algae partner that we've uh, provided systems to. We're no longer actively in the business. So Resha, if you want, we will give you a proper referral and we'll take it from there. We have a, a very good partner in the algae industry who and we, we have excellent technology. We just had to move out, move out of it because it was no longer viable for our purpose, which was biofuels. All right. Now, what became of Ponster? Remember that, uh, gosh, a couple of years ago, we had an opportunity to clean up a, a trailer park lagoon and these you know, all over the Southern part of America, below the Mason Dixon line, um, there are trailer parks and their idea of sanitation is a pond in the back. And it just basically dumps in a pond. Well, the local departments of uh, environmental protection have been working on improving that and fixing that. um, And they have been requiring the owners of these trailer parks to fix it. And so we had an opportunity to work with one. It was our very first and I must say that Claudia Hall was very brave. Uh, let's see what came of this because it it is uh, it's an interesting story. Here we go. All right, Claudia Hall, you are the amazing pioneer who got involved with us on our brand new pilot product test program. Tell us a story about how, first of all, the situation you were in and what you were faced with and then how it went from there. Okay. So we were in a situation where we had a lagoon that was not performing and it was under sanctions with Adam Mm -hmm. and we needed to basically make it go right. Uh, The property had been in trouble for some time already and we needed to find a solution like ASAP. And that's where Origin uh, Clear came in to solve the issue of the lagoon, which is basically a sewer processing plant. I mean, simply put, that that just is what it is. It's a form of decentralized water treatment, but it's basically just a pond where the sewage sits. And over time, I guess it gets better, but unfortunately it can't be dumped in its current state. It, It is far above the bacterial levels allowed for dumping in the groundwater, right? And and for some reason, you were not able to work with the city on the sewage side. Correct. So we were outside of the city limits. And so the city would not extend the line to pick up from where the park is located. And so we had to resort to other mediums. And at the time, we couldn't find, seemed like any other solution. And Origin Clear decided to put in this prototype to try and help out. Right. Well, you were an amazingly patient client because our division, Modular Water Systems, has great technology, but this was really its first attempt to work with a lagoon. It's They're, they're very, very shallow. There's not a lot of water and there's a lot of sediment. And so you have a circulation issue. As you say, there's an issue with when you clean it and it comes back, you had to basically compartmentalize the lagoon, all these things were lessons learned. But as you say, there was an early attempt to use Uh, a very high-tech material. In the end, we went with a more conventional material approach. Am I right? Correct. We have a very successful installation of another mobile home park where we learned from these these lessons. And it's basically a membrane bioreactor, which is very standard. Fortunately, we were able to reuse the modular water systems container, the structure, and basically swap out the elements. So obviously you you were a guinea pig. And uh, you worked your way through it. Did you have alternatives that made sense or did you just have to keep working with us? No, we really didn't have a whole lot of options. We had originally seen other product, but was above our budget. But in the end, even though it wasn't the original route that was seeked out to, to solve the problem, the problem was solved. You helped us develop a product that today is, is well accepted and installs very well. Yeah. Well, Claudia... I just wanted to thank you for helping us create this new uh, product line called the Ponster. Absolutely. So, yeah. So the track record was that we got into this with this idea of using a very, very high tech material, but ultimately we uh, went to the tried and true technology that Dan Early had developed 
which was membrane bioreactors inside one of his patented containers. And many of you have seen the amazing uh, testimonial by um, the uh, operator of Neville Home Parks, where it was installed beautifully and worked very, very well uh, immediately. So my good friend, Claudia Hall, uh, who is actually a personal friend, was the pioneer that helped us get there. And I want to thank her. We're no longer marketing this as Ponster. Uh, it's simply part of the standardized product line. Um, what we do with mobile home parks is simply a version of the Avera Skid uh, system. Just to give you an idea, Avera Skid is the above ground container. Avera Treat is either fully or, or partially underground. And so the Avera Skid product line is uh, 5, 10, 15, and 20 gallons per day. And we simply spec it for that location. And it's identical to what might be put in place for a housing development, for example. There's really no difference between a mobile home park and a housing development for us these days. So we were very successful in that area. And as I say, I like to do these recaps. So next steps are to continue to expand into the mobile home park space with this um, Averiskid product. All right. Um, Let's do something with a little bit of video for a change. How about that? Um, Tom, uh, he wants to know if we have uh, before and after pics of the pond looking clear. Um, that's a good question. I don't think anybody went and took pictures, but we had the, the Alabama Department of, of Environmental Management, ADEM. Uh, there are requirements for putting directly into the ground. So it was very, very clean. How many homes were in that park? Eugene Tully, well, it's about, I think about 50 or 60, as I recall. Um, it was a fairly large park and um, it was a really great uh, test, but I think Neville Home Park is actually bigger, if I recall. Okay, so let's take a look at this video. Hello and welcome back to the Prosper Project. Now, one of my favorite things is the opportunity this podcast affords me to bring you insights from inspiring change makers. And my guest today certainly fits that description. Riggs Eckleberry has tapped into the trillion dollar water market and he calls it the new gold. As the founder and CEO of water technology company Origin Clear, Riggs is a tech pioneer at the intersection of crypto and water. His company is giving entrepreneurs the opportunity to invest in a hard asset, providing the tools to make it successful and aiding the planet's sustainability. Welcome, Riggs. It's so good to have you here today. Such a pleasure, Lorraine. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about Origin Clear, what it is, what you do. Throughout the 80s, 90s, and into the 2000s, I was a tech guy. And I loved the dot com because we went from using computers for calculation, like accounting, right, to communication, which was I loved it. Eventually, my lack of modesty overcame me and I thought I should be a good CEO. <laughs> so I, I remember talking to a fund that I was at the time I was a number two of a software company that we're getting onto the NASDAQ. We did so successfully. And, you know, every number two thinks he can be a better number one. So, so I was like, I think I'm going to be a good CEO. And they said, yes. But we're pivoting into green. We're not doing tech anymore. We're doing green. And I was like, okay, this is 2005, 2006, really going into 2007. And um, they said, and we specifically think that algae has a potential for being the next biofuel. Mm. I and remember I was, that. I remember that period. Yeah. Well, it was when, when oil was at $120 a barrel. <laughs> There's and a good so, incentive right there to innovate, right? Anything was possible. And so we launched this um, this company at the time called Origin Oil because that algae was the original oil. It wasn't a bunch of dinosaurs. It was a lot of algae. Petroleum came from algae and can be made today from algae. And so we launched this company and went straight away into the public space. And we were having so much fun. We were getting lots of media attention because, you know, algae, who knew, right? That kind of thing. Right. And then fracking got invented, which dropped the price of oil as low as $35 at one point. And we realized that algae for a long time was just going to be a science experiment, right? Mm. And so we took our algae extraction technology and turned it into a sewage extraction technology in water. And that birthed Origin Clear in the water space. So we basically took the same tech, reused it, and changed the company's uh, mission. Now, 
one big difference is that from one day to the next, I was invisible. Water is like so taken for granted. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I turn on the faucet, water comes out, I flush the toilet, water goes away, everything's fine, right? Well, everything's not fine, but I was having a very hard time getting attention for it. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I just couldn't get um, people to re recognize what the, the problem was, which was that our basic infrastructure for water that was built in the early part of the 20th century has been degrading continuously and is not funded properly at all. And that is starting to result in all these issues like Flint, Michigan, and other places we haven't heard about, but that are very, very real. And so how do you solve it? And I keep hearing, oh, we're going to throw billions at the problem and uh, yeah, billions and billions and billions. The only problem is, is that nobody's doing it. The Biden administration did a $1.2 trillion budget for um, infrastructure. It was great, except it only had one two thousandth of it was devoted to water, mm -hmm. right? And so for some reason, water's out of sight, out of mind. It doesn't get the proper allocations. So you can't, you know, just keep wishful thinking like, well, the, someday they'll allocate enough money. Yeah, Meanwhile, when we're in crisis, right? You know, we don't want to be waiting for crisis for these I things better, to be addressed. Sure, Lorraine, but the crises happen. And they get like, look at Jackson, Mississippi had terrible problems, still does. And I contacted a good friend of mine who's in the um, Mississippi Assembly and he, literally based in Jackson. And he said, oh, that's the city's problem. And I was like, oh. that, right? So there's this like, you know, not my, not my table kind of problem. So yeah, to do about it. Now, in 2016, I read a seminal piece of research from Lux Research that said, Decentralization of water is the new thing. Hmm. No longer relying on the central utility, but just like with solar, doing it where you are. And I became a big apostle of that. I was shouting it from the rooftops. Again, nobody was listening at the time. But that has been changing for the last year, two, two years. There's much, much more attention. And recently, uh, water tech, aqua tech, call it what you like, has been exploding we just got a unicorn in the space from MIT and it's starting to happen. So all of a sudden the whole idea of empowering businesses to do their own water treatment, which they prefer mm -hmm. has become the thing. And here's what's amazing, Lorraine, is that you know 90% of all water demand is by industry and agriculture. So if we pull them That's away- so interesting. Right, yeah. we, we don't think about that. And meanwhile, in California, we're being told to take, you know, short showers and so forth. But that is, we're only 10% of the problem, right? Yeah. So the idea then is unburden the utilities, let businesses do their own treatment. And then that frees up the utilities to do the right job for the human beings that are literally at health risk every single day. So this is so interesting. So basically what you're saying is that the, the um, concern and the focus on who takes care of our water should be kind of um, taken away from the government and the utilities and really put in the hands of the businesses for, for kind of purifying and taking care of their own water. And then the public utilities focus on the individuals, the households per se. Is that what I'm hearing? Exactly. And, uh, you know, Ireland, in Ireland, water is free. Well, why shouldn't it be free here? Well, 90% of it's being used by industry. So um, now, uh, to be clear, I'm not talking about incoming water. Generally, that's going to keep coming from the municipalities. We're not going to be drilling wells for everybody, uh, except in, ex in extreme cases. Uh, what we're really talking about is the polluted water that is really messing up our rivers, lakes, and the ocean and our mm -hmm. groundwater. California, for example, every single aquifer in California has hydrocarbon pollution from, you know, heavy uh, oil, oil well drilling that, frankly, was not properly monitored for decades. And so, the harm being done to the ecology is is really terrible. And we can focus on that if, again, we we let these businesses do their, their own treatment. Now, why do they like it? Number one, there's been a tremendous inflation of water sewage rates. It's out of control. People think that utilities are, are regulated with water rates. No, they're not. So it just goes up. And lots, for example, lots of households are defaulting on their water bills because they just can't pay it. Um, so businesses like a nice steady price. And secondly, they like being able to recycle the water 
that way they save money and it's good for the environment and good for droughts and all that. And finally, they have more control over the regulatory situation than they do from the arbitrary central utility. So it's popular. And so we made it our mission to number one, downsize the technology from the big, big systems that they have in the sewage plants down to, you know, in the corner of a brewery kind of thing. Oh, wow. Right. That's amazing. I don't know if our listeners have ever been to a water treatment plant, but I certainly have been to several. I don't know why it sounds a little weird to admit that, but, um, and that's fascinating that you can reduce the size that much. So already there's a benefit and an impact. Bingo. The second part is we recognize that these businesses aren't necessarily funded for a million dollars for their water treatment system. They're not in the water business. Mm -hmm. And so we, we set up this program called Water on Demand, which is basically water as a service. So when you transfer over from the city to your own, you still pay on the meter. You don't have to worry about a big capital expense up front. And that is the big breakthrough that we're working on. And so Water on Demand, this new creation of ours, is what we've been working on for some time. And we, in parallel, built a group called Modular Water Systems, which is these compact systems. And it's been a huge success. It's one of those overnight successes, but it took been, years in the making. <laughs> we started, yes, we know all about them. <laughs> started in 2018. We brought in a wonderful guru of, of this whole decentralization who'd been doing it again in the dark for many, many years and gave him a budget. And since 2018, he finally has emerged as a major player and we integrated it with Water On Demand. So now we have the technology side and we have the capital, you know, the service side so you don't have to pay money up front. The third important part is everybody in the water industry is funded by the big guys, funded by, for example, there's a major water as a service player that's funded by Morgan Stanley Infrastructure Partners. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not going to invest in Morgan Stanley, right? right? And another, another company in the space is, is a VC funded company. Again, you're not going to get access. Right. We decided that we are going to enable regular investors to invest in water programs at the asset level. And it creates a new investable asset with residuals that can be just like oil wells, they can be generational assets. And that has been amazingly popular because I don't know about you, but I'm constantly wondering, what do I do with the money I have? I, the stock market, forget it. Yeah, Bitcoin, yeah. I don't know. AI, forget it, it's already done. By the time we get right. to these things, yeah, there are the ship has pretty much sailed. Yeah. But water yeah. is still early. And so we've said water is the people's asset. That's our new motto. Yeah. And so number one, we fund it with regular investors. Number two, we use this compact technology that's breakthrough. And number three, we enable it to be capital free. I'm finally being uh we're finally being noticed. <laughs> yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, this this is really exciting to me. So um most of my clients are in the impact space. So to me, I see two, two sides of the impact here. I see the social impact in um, being able to create legacy, a legacy of wealth through investment. Yes. And the investment is in things that will make our planet healthier, keep our water uh, flowing cleanly through this process, the technology and the equipment that you have um, created. So who, who are the people that this is intended for? Like if someone's listening, how do they know this is a good investment for me? Um, yeah, what, tell us a little bit about that. So we're focusing on primarily the accredited investor, okay. which is, you know, if you're making 200,000 a year or with your cohabitant, in the same household, 300,000, mm -hmm. uh, or you have a million dollars in, in assets outside of your primary home, then you qualify to invest in this program. We, we were also working on a, a crowdfunding so that anybody can join. That's, that. that's pause at the moment for this related reasons, but it's a program that we're going to be continuing. So anybody can invest from a thousand dollars on up because I don't, I don't like it when only accredited investors can get in. I'm like, why? It's ridiculous, right? So the crowdfunding yeah, concept, you know, it does have limits. People going to invest up to 10% of their annual income, which is a reasonable limit. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you know, it's kind of like these uh, political campaigns that are much more robust if they take a lot of small donations versus a few big cats. 
they will have more impact over time, I think. And it's it's more of a movement in the water industry that said the first trillionaire will be in water. Mm. We don't want one trillionaire. We want a million millionaires. I like that. Yeah. So break Make it, it down. accessible. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's so interesting. Well, I mean, water is the people's source, right? You kind of said it. It's like, you know, you have your, we need water to survive. It's something that we're all dependent on. And yet we haven't really been t- paying attention. You know, things like Flint, Michigan happen or other things. There was some bacteria in the water in Manhattan a week or so ago. And right. so they were told not to drink from the tap. And that's New York, which has the best water in the country. It's ridiculous. It's, it's scary, right? It's oh. scary. And so there is kind of this threatening gathering cloud, if you will, around the quality of our water to the point where people are wondering, should I drink tap or should I just buy, you know, water by the gallon? But then we're talking about investing in plastic. So you're kind of offering a way that is a healthier investment, a healthier process and doing your best to make it accessible to as many individuals who wish to invest as possible. Correct. Now on the personal level, like you say, uh, the at the household level, I get asked that a lot, even though it's not our space. Because again, we work on the 90%, not the 10%. Right. Uh, but we do work with a lot of housing developments, for example. That's uh, an interesting phenomenon. I'll get back to the tap water in a second, but this fascinating thing happening, which was post-COVID, there, there's, there was a move, rural uh, exurbia move, right? And as a result, many, many people started working from home. I mean, we moved in 2020 from Los Angeles to Clearwater, Florida. That's the palm trees behind me. And it's, it's, we love it. Well, what happens is it puts a lot of pressure on these small rural or semi-rural utilities. And in places like North Texas, where there's a a huge land boom, they're way ahead of sewage. And so you have to have these self-contained systems for the housing developments. And we're doing that very successfully. So that is a phenomenon that's happening at the residential level when you're talking about developments. Now, as far as personal situations go, people need to be very aware of the water situation, there's a, a site called uh, EWG, environmentalworkinggroup.org. EWG.org, there's a, if you look up water quality by zip code, you can put in your zip code and you'll find out the quality of the water in your district, which is usually compliant, but unfortunately regulations have not kept up, right? So it's compliant, but then EWG shows you, well, it's compliant, but it's 5,000 times too high per more recent studies that have not been made their way into regulation. So I, I strongly believe that people should filter their water at home. Us personally, we bought a whole home thing that was not, you don't have to get a reverse osmosis thing for your whole home, but something that goes down to uh, ultra filtration, which is 0.2 microns. And then under the sink, we have the RO, the reverse osmosis. That's you know ultra pure for our drinking water. And then we put special filters on the shower heads to uh, make sure that we don't get the Roundup into our bodies because Roundup is a smaller particle than 0.2 microns and it is extremely harmful in in accumulations right now. Yeah. uh, It's just a good idea to, so that combination of things is what people should do. So we spent, you know, I don't know, thousand dollars. It wasn't a lot of money because we weren't trying to do an incredible, perfect job in the old home, you know, all right. Well, uh, that was fascinating. So with that, let's uh, let's jump on to the feature that we wait for all week long. Freewheeling discussion. Albeit a brief one, I believe. It's a full hour. <laughs> full hour, dude. Yeah, I got it. Well, you know, it's always a challenge deciding what, what to cut, what to leave in, what to leave out. Sure. But anyway, um, just uh, to cover the new to the street, the remaining uh, airings, of that fabulous um, interview that you did, July 13th, 17th, and 19th. So that puts us at um, the 13th is next Thursday, a week from now, 9.30 p.m. PST, uh, after this show ends, basically, July 17th, 10.30 p.m. And then um, this is the good one, July 29th, Bloomberg, 6.30 p.m. EST. That's the money shot. You had a really nice cross-section there, right? Mm Mm-hmm. We got to hear kind of a it's interesting how different uh, interviewers kind of latch on to different aspects of it. But I think all your interviewers kind of got it at the end. Yeah. They do tend to gravitate back towards 
um, you know, drinking water and our water quality. And what I often describe it, and I've, I've had this conversation with Jane, it's an upstream problem. If you deal with what's being polluted upstream, the need, like, you know, we don't want to drink our tap water. Okay. Of course we don't. But if we treat it at the point where it's being discharged, where it's, it's being polluted, we, we have to do far less, you know, at that micro level down at the, in the homes, right? Well, it's a downstream that becomes the new upstream, right? Right. As pollution eventually comes back into the system through the groundwater and so forth. So um, that's what it's all about. Uh, Manish Chopra, did I miss your Tallahassee discussion? Uh, yeah, we th that was the earlier thing about that that bill. Just uh, wait for the link to the video, and the it was the very first thing I did in this hour. All right, Steve, uh, Stephen Davis says, you guys in a roll. Thanks for all the hard work in making our investments productive. That's very kind of you. No, we're very happy with how things are going. Um, the the uh, Modular Water team is cranking. Pro I got some great news on Progressive Water. Uh, some, some great... Um, uh, business was done recently. They just got a, a million dollar order uh, recently that um, nice. we tend to forget to, about progressive water, but those guys crank. They're super hardworking and they get all the big projects, but they're onesies and twosies, right? They're not the assembly line stuff. Right. Uh, and so anyway, they're, they're doing, they're doing uh, very well under the leadership of Tom Marchesello. We'll do an update very soon on that. I think that's worth doing. Um, and so then the water on demand, um, you know, creation of the water on demand contracts again is being inserted early in the in the in these contracts with modular water, so that it's discussed very early on. We're allowing plenty of time in our forecast for water on demand to develop on the on the back end of modular water, which is really on a roll. So that's where we stand. Very cool. Bill out your Zoom survey. It's important, and be sure to check in with Ken. If you're interested in what's going on with investment, um, okay. Tom says you mentioned crowdfunding in your interview. Are you bringing that back? Yes, the plan is to bring it back. Each of these filings lasts for a year. I believe that we were effective back in February, as I, if I recall, something like that. Anyway, so or maybe it was in the in the latter half of the year. But regardless, you just you just renew it. So we will be back with that. It's near and dear to my heart. But we want to do it right. I, th I think that that you know Ken has done some amazing work with, and you know we, uh, Ken, we got to get AJ on the show. We're gonna have a lot of fun. Uh, AJ Fikaj is is the corporate development czar, and he has been working. He's out the Wonder Boy. He's, he's my, the man. He's, he's the mensch. He's the he, he, He's my Wonder Boy. Right. He's 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 brought sanity back to my life. Right. Um, yeah, no, listen, I, I think we could um, we could probably talk him into getting on. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Next Thursday. You have to move over. You're going to you're going to have to you're going to have to like you're going to have to do that. Is it next Thursday? I'm on the big iron bird on, on Wednesday and uh, I'll get the I'll get the rugrats settled in, get him on the beach and I'll scoot over to your house. We'll have dinner and then we'll, we'll do the we'll do the briefing. There we go. That's a great idea. And but in addition, I I, I want to get AJ because no, we'll get we'll get him on. He'll be the remote guy, is what I meant. Yeah, we'll, we'll be like the guys in those vitamin commercials that all stand next. I'm to I'm surrounded him. by a glass a glass table. You remember? Oh, that. okay. But we'll figure we'll, it out. We'll make it work. We'll make it work. All right. We'll we'll be a virtual in the same condo. That's a, like you'll hear me. You'll hear me talking on your mic. Right. That'll be fun. All right, kids. Well, uh, we've taken up a chunk of your time. It's been great having you. Uh, I've hoped you had fun listening. And uh, we're having a lot of fun over here. Really, a lot of investors, new, fresh investors are coming in to build the funding for water on demand pro projects. I think that's the best thing that's going on right now. And I'm very proud of uh, you, Ken, AJ, Devin, the whole team. You guys are doing a great job. I will promise we get, we get AJ on next Thursday. We'll make it oh, happen. Wait, 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 he's going on vacation. All right, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. We'll have him on the phone. <laughs> yeah, we can. We can do that. All right, then. Take care, guys. Good night. Have a good night. Thank you so much.